Look! Look, the dynamic duo! <laughs> uh, welcome to the dynamic duo. I'm Franz. I'm Kevin. Welcome to the new back cave in Avengers Tower, everybody. Kevin, my friend, we are so honored today because, I mean, I'm telling you right now, we have a guest that, that's beyond our comprehension. I'm talking some, about someone who has had such an impact in the industry uh, and so many levels. He's created characters like Bullseye, Blade, Nova, Black Cat. Of course, we're talking about the creator, the co-creator of the new Teen Titans. And so characters like Cyborg and Starfire and Raven and so on and so forth. A person who's had who's worked on so many characters for so long, Fantastic Four, uh, Tomb of Dracula, Spider-Man, a giant, an absolute giant of the industry. We're talking about Mr. Marv Wolfman. Marv, welcome to the show. Hi there, wow, I'm impressed. Who are you talking about? Certainly not me. <laughs> we are absolutely talking about you. We are absolutely talking about you and before we tell you how much we appreciate your work, I think the first question that I'd like to ask you, and it's a question that I ask everyone that we get an opportunity to, to, to talk to, all the, all the heroes that, that we get the opportunity to talk to, is do you get the impact that you've had and that your work has had on us and on so many other people? Um, before I got into the business as a professional, I was a fan for many, many years. So I understand how the comic, how comics affect the reader, the fan, uh, because I was one of those as well. And I fully understand all that. That's all um, intellectual. Emotionally, I have no idea why. Uh, I really don't, um, I, I don't say to me, it's, I'm just doing uh, what I enjoy. Uh, I've got, you know, one of these type of jobs that I've been wanting to do since I was, six years old or so. And wow. so I don't think about the effect it has on anyone else. It's just, uh, you know, it's thrilling uh, because I remember how I was to the professionals at the time because I was there when the very first convention started and the first time you met the people. Uh, but for years, I didn't know who they were uh, in many cases because they were on credits. You didn't even know their names. So Understood. I, as I say, I intellectually understand because I've got, I went through that, but emotionally, like that's somebody else. Understood. Understood perfectly. And uh, before Kevin asks his first questions, I just want you to know how much your work has meant to me personally, um, how much it's impacted our lives. Basically, you, you're one of the great creators, artists, writers of our generation. I mean that. Um, as important as anyone, for whether it's Stanley Kubrick or even the, the Shakespeare of our world, because your work impacted millions, millions of people, particularly younger people, on an intimate basis. Like we learn from your work. We learn from the stuff that you wrote. And, you know, I just want to thank you personally for, for that. And, and just to let you know how much I personally appreciated you and, and everything that you brought to I appreciate that a lot. Uh, it, it's, as I say, very hard to put yourself in that position or even sometimes believe it because writers never believe anything that because uh, uh, we know all the trouble and how hard it is to put it together. So we can't believe it actually has an effect. But again, because I was a fan for many, many years first, I have that intellectual knowledge of how comics affected me. But uh, I think everyone else, you know, I, I just don't know, uh, but I'll accept it. Uh, it's always nice to hear. It's really nice to hear, especially Wonderful. when, when it's a, not a great day or something. So <laughs> you, get, you get an email uh, and it's a nice one. And it tells you that so many people at this point because of email and because uh, of, I think just being around so long, um, people do send emails telling me how much a certain story or a series affected them and it's shocking it's always surprising to me but it's always very gratifying wow well yes it, it shouldn't be shocking because it, it is so wonderful but i i understand what you mean perfectly and it's fascinating because almost that humility that that humbleness is perhaps what makes great creators and so 
And so it means that much more to me. And you started early in the industry. You started, you said that you started as a fan, but, but you started early, like way back in like 1965 and 66 and so on and so forth. So what were you a fan of and who were you a fan of at the time? Well, um, I've been a fan since the 1950s. Uh, first with Superman because of the TV show. And I saw the show and at the end it says it's based on the comic book. And immediately that day, my friend and I who saw Superman for the first time went to the corner where there was a candy store and bought our first comic books. So I was probably eight, nine years old at the time. And um, the only, there weren't that many comic books out at that particular time. The only superheroes that were out were Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman. There were no others. That's the, right. Uh, there were war books. There were all sorts of uh, other comic books, funny animal ones, Archie comics, you know, dead ghost type stories uh, for Casper and things like that. Um, so, and there was no Marvel. Uh, so the only books that you could buy were the Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman. And their ancillary titles, Superman had Superman Action Comics, Superboy, um, Lois Lane had a comic, uh, uh, Jimmy Olsen had a comic, uh, Batman had also had a half dozen books, Wonder Woman just had the one. Um, so yeah, those were the books that I read and then got into the science fiction comics. Uh, Strange Adventures, Mystery in Space, things of that sort, still no Marvel. So there weren't uh, any uh, things. Marvel didn't come into being until like 1960. That's right, that's right. Yeah. I had already been reading comics uh, for five, six, seven years. Um, then DC introduced uh, First Flash in 1955, I think, or 55 or 56. Uh, then when Flash was a success, they introduced Green Lantern and then Hawkman. Uh, the Adam, it was all of those characters coming back. And then uh, Marvel uh, uh, joined the fray and started coming up with all their books as well. And then I was hooked. Fascinating. Fascinating. Kevin? Mr. Wolfman, based on uh, what you just said, uh, in terms of uh, what got you, you know, started uh, back in the 60s and the 50s and what have you, uh, one of the things that Franz and I were able to find out is that you had worked with uh, Stephen King on Tales of Suspense. Um, could you uh, kind of break that down and let us know how that came about and what that was like for you? Well, uh, I was uh, publishing, uh, I was a fan, as I say, and I sent a letter to, uh, to Mystery in Space and Julie Schwartz, who was the editor of Mystery in Space, at the time, always printed everyone's address, um, something nobody else did. But he printed the address as a way of getting the fans to communicate with each other. Uh, within a week or so after the comic came out, I got two fanzines sent to me. Uh, that's how they built up um, uh, the, fan, the fans. So, you know, the people who were doing fanzines at the time, which were the amateur fan magazines, um, would find other fans and send it to them, send a copy in with the idea that maybe they will subscribe uh, and pay for them, you know, uh, the first one's free. Um, and uh, one, so I started publishing my own fanzines and I published oh. a superhero fanzine called mm. uh, Super Adventures and I published a horror mystery fanzine called Stories of Suspense and I published a funny animal one called um, uh, The Foob and an opinion fanzine, uh, which was uh, sort of like the common sections uh, of today's uh, internet. Um, and a friend of mine uh, said, because I was looking for material beyond what I wrote uh, to be in there. And a friend of mine had a, said uh, he knew somebody uh, uh, who did a good story for another fanzine, but they didn't publish the whole thing right away. Uh, and he sent it to me and it uh, was by some kid named Steve. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, I, he was a teenager, you know. Uh, yeah. He wrote a story called I Was a Teenage Grave Robber. Um, 
and I liked it, and I published it. Uh, I had not met him. Uh, it was all through the mail. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I think he did fairly well for himself. <laughs> it's, that's a fascinating question, because it wow. says that, first of all, you were enterprising from the very, you know, you were an entrepreneur, you were, you were someone who, who was destined for greatness very, very early on. Or, or plummeting to uh, failure. It could have been either well, way. Well, actually, no, could absolutely have been either not. Because... Fortunately, it wasn't. <laughs> the question I have is, does Stephen King remember that story? And do you have any kind of relationship with him now? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, there's a couple of funny things with that. Uh, I, later on, I was an editor of Warren magazines uh, for a, a brief time. Uh, he did uh, Creepy Eerie and Vampirella. And um, Stephen King uh, found out that I was the editor there and, and he sent me some stories hoping because I published the stuff in my fanzines that I published, uh, I published that. Now, what he didn't know at the time was I had already left Warren and they did not forward his mail, to, forward his stories to me or anything. Um, and the person who followed me into that job never got back to him. Uh, they weren't paying, I mean, they were paying really bad rates, uh, sure. but, but still. And so he always thought I just sort of uh, uh, ignored him or something. And uh, <laughs> uh, as opposed to what it was. So he, he mentioned that to me and I said, no, no, I just never got it. Uh, but it worked out because it, it, you think about it, if I had been, if I had stayed at Warren because we were only paying $25 for a story that was so much less than everybody else, I mean, unbelievably less, I would have bought it because it wasn't that much money. The story was fine and you need material. And if I bought it, he would have probably gotten into comics and he'd be, you know, instead of the most successful writer in history, he'd, be out of work as a comic book writer now. So, you know, I, th I think he should pay me for not buying his story. <laughs> well, for the record, I, I do not want you to sell yourself short by any stretch of the imagination. Stephen King may be uh, a, a bigger well-known um, name uh, in the world, but um, um, he, he, you know, he doesn't hold a candle to my Marv Wolfman. That's all I have to say okay. about that. <laughs> Kevin, Mr. W uh, Mr. Wolfman, I've got to know. I've got to know. How did Black Hawk come about? Black Hawk. I was a huge fan of the Black Hawk comic um, for a long time, and DC, uh, when Quality Comics, the publisher of Black Hawks, back in the nineteen forties and fifties, uh, when uh, you know shut down, as did most comic book companies at the time, and. Um, DC took over Black Hawk and gave it to the editor who suddenly turned it into like a science fiction magazine. They were fighting aliens, uh, all sorts of stuff that I really, really hated. So not knowing uh, that you just didn't do this, uh, I had a, for sending a letter to Julie Schwartz, he used to give out gifts. Uh, and one of the gifts he sent to me was a copy of a Gardner Fox Adam Strange script. So I knew what a script looked like based on what, what I had gotten. And I just sat down and wrote my own script. Oh, um, man. And I sent it in to the editor and never heard a word like Stephen King to me. Um, mm -hmm. uh, later, he, that editor uh, left and the new editor, Dick Giordano, uh, got his desk and um, uh, Dick had been the editor at Charlton Comics and he was a very, very good artist as well. And uh, Dick um, opened his desk and saw this envelope that was never opened. It was a large envelope that was never opened by the previous editor. And he opened it and he saw it was the script by me uh, for, this was like a year later. Um, and he called me based on uh, my phone number was there and said, did I still want him to read it? And I said, yes, and uh, they thought it was good. And he bought the story. They had um, another writer rewrite a lot of, uh, most of the dialogue because my dialogue at that point, I was, you know, 
was still a kid. I wasn't very good, but the story, they liked an awful lot. And uh, so that was my very first story, um, uh, first sale. Uh, within a week or so, I then sold a mystery story to House of Mystery. Uh, that one I dialogued and uh, as opposed to write the story for it. And uh, so I, within a short time, I had both the story that I did the story of and another one that I did the dialogue on. Fascinating. Fascinating. See, that, what? That, that's the proof that the hand of fate was there. <laughs> Absolutely. Why, Absolutely. Why the editor never opened the envelope, I don't know. And why he just didn't throw it out if he wasn't going to read it. Why didn't exactly. he just throw it out? No wow. idea. Exactly. And the way that it the way that it works too, the first editor may not have connected to that story or whatever, you know, and, and so it worked perfectly. Again, the hand of fate. What was so that's as a fan, you're a fan, just as we are fans, and we can only imagine. But you're a fan enough to do a fanzine. You're a fan enough to be that connected to the material that you're, you're submitting material. What must it have felt like to be now? hired as a writer and see your name being printed as a writer of of of, of, of black hawk and and even that you know the teen titans you you we worked very early on with the team it's something that most people most fans most people don't realize we think of you as and we'll talk about that later but we think of you as the new teen Titan, titans writer but you actually wrote the teen titans back in 1968 yeah yeah uh yeah uh, because the not everybody put credits uh, and not everybody knew it. Now, in my case, I think they, uh, the Teen Titans, the, the couple, of, couple of the issues that I wrote, that I came up with um, did not have my name on it. And then there's mm. a couple that did. So what, what, what did it feel like to, 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 you know, be in the industry now, coming from a fan to now being to part of it? Well, you know, what you can imagine what it is. You uh, sort of amazing. You can just hope that it keeps happening. You don't know. Uh, you're just beginning, so you, you're not really quite as good as the professionals who are already there. And unlike today, though they had these books, House of Mystery, House of Secrets, Tales of the Unexpected, which had short little stories. So they didn't mind trying new writers out on those short books because uh, I wrote stories as, as short as two pages. Uh, uh, I did a, a whole bunch of things called Kane's True Case Files, and some of them were actually one page long. Um, mm. So uh, they weren't risking an awful lot by uh, allowing some new kids to come in and practice. They may find somebody who, who worked out. Uh, today, there is no place to learn. There is no place to do a bad job. Uh, Interesting. There's no place to be told how to do it better. Um, because they only hire professionals who had already been around. Uh, so Understood. It's, it's sort of sad. Um, we, all of us, and there were a lot of us benefited, writers and artists, young kids at the time. I mean, my one of those true case, case files was the very first story drawn by Bernie Wrightson. Another one was the first wow. by Frank Brunner. Um, uh, it was my first stories. You know, uh, so it worked on the artist side and the writer side, but there's no place today that you could sell a one page story. Sure. So, sure. Sure. We're going to ask you about that too, um, because it's, it is a very important topic. You know, the state of the industry today, what you feel about it, and what, the, you know, what you think is good and what you think is bad. Because again, the whole point of the show is to honor and respect the generation that brought this about. Um, and so, and so, so you, you, you know, you mentioned Bernie Wrightson. You had the opportunity to work with some giants in the industry as well. Yes. Uh, so, you know, you're coming into Marvel as a protege of Roy Thomas, which, by the way, we, we, we will hope to interview him uh, sometime soon, hopefully next month. Um, you worked with Bernie Wrightson. You worked with Lynn Ween. What was that like? Those types of collaboration. Of course, we, we'll we'll get to the great collaboration of George Perez. But what was that like to work with the Gil Kanes and so on and so forth with, with the different um, between Marvel and DC? Obviously, Gil. Uh, in the case of someone like Gil Kane or Carmen Fantino, I was a fan of theirs. Uh, 
the others, the Bernie Wrightsons, the, uh, you know, my colluders and all of those type of people, they were my peers. Uh, they were breaking into the industry at the same exact time that I was. So Makes sense. we were a bunch of kids who all became friends and there were month, there were regular parties. We all got together, et cetera. But that's because all of us were about the same age and we were all breaking into the business at exactly the same time, you know, uh, and uh, it, it was cool. It was wonderful. And then when you become part of the, the professional establishment, you get brought in by other people who, you know, so you become friends with some of them, some of them you don't, because unfortunately, a lot of, a lot of us without knowing it at the time, were being brought in to eventually replace the, the older talent. Understood. And, you know, uh, which is a real shame, but you, I think talent has to keep growing, otherwise, uh, otherwise, it's not up to date. It's not. It's what not what somebody is reading today. So you have to keep changing your style. You have to keep approaching it differently than uh, you started out. I don't. I don't write at all like I used to write. Fascinating. Uh, so uh, and hopefully, you know, uh, I'll continue to work. Now most of the work I'm doing now, they people don't see because I'm writing video games. I'm writing. Uh, That's right. Uh, commercial jobs for DC and other places which go out to uh, manufacturers and such like that so it's not stuff that's always seen by the fans uh, even though I'm doing a lot of stuff connected with that you know there are rarely credits on a video game correct correct I'm, I'm, we're going to ask you about I'm long enough to read them anyway if they were <laughs> they're always at the end of the uh they're at the end of the game which means you have to finish the game then you have to sit through thousands of names because correct uh there's so many people working on the animation and on, and on on every part of it most people probably never read uh who actually produced uh, produce that stuff so they have no idea of what i do uh, absolutely yeah you're right people just assume that i re retired years ago and i've never stopped working Wow, fascinating. Now I'm gonna definitely ask you about that when we get to that section, because I, I wonder what it's like, what the difference is, what you like better, what you enjoy, what, what you don't enjoy. But before I do that, and, and forgive me, Kevin, I'm gonna jump in a little bit because I it's think okay. we wanna you know, bounce back and forth with the questions. You did something that was relatively unique and powerful. It didn't quite pan out, but as African-American men, I'm curious about that. You, you created one of the first black characters uh, for DC. It, it didn't get published, but what was there a thought? Was it an accident? Was it, you know, was there a thought behind that at all, uh, or, or did it just, you know, was it just organic? Uh, that I uh, are you asking was a thought that I was the creating a black character? Correct. But in um, those days, you know, DC there were no minorities necessarily. No. And so okay. it, it's an interesting choice to make as a as a creator, and I guess I'm wondering was it was it just you know was it a purposeful thing or was it just you know? No, it it was very purposeful. Um, you know, when you go to school and you're a kid, uh, you generally go to the school, the high school that's in your area, which means the other kids are kids from your area. Correct. Which means whatever the makeup of your, uh, your block, your street, whatever it is, is probably the people that you know. Correct. I didn't go to a high school like that. I didn't know anyone. I went to the high school of art and design uh, because I was uh, intending to be an artist. And that's a, that unlike all of this, unlike high schools that take kids from their local area, art and design took kids from every one of the New York City boroughs. So you were no longer, nobody in your class to, would you know. You, uh, you wouldn't know anyone who was in your class because somebody maybe from uh, Queens, somebody from Brooklyn, somebody from, and because it's people from all the different parts of New York, there were plenty of black artists it was for art uh, uh, there. So the classes were very much, um, different ethnic groups, different, uh, you know, uh, lots of uh, men and women and all sorts of people that 
you just would not necessarily see in a class. If I went to, I was, I lived in Flushing, New York. If I went to a school in Flushing, it would only be the people who were around me, which were probably white, um, uh, you know, middle class uh, type people in sure. art design. It was everybody, and once you once you get used to all these people that you would not normally never meet because you were not, didn't live in the same area, there's no question as to why, why do a black character? The question is, why aren't you doing a black character? Wow. They <laughs> half, I feel like half, half my classroom. Wow. Half the kids are black, you know, uh, or, or Asian or whatever else it was. So sure. it was very much a thought on, on my part to just make it look like my class. You know, because we, I was in a cartooning class. So we had all these cartoonists. My teacher was a black, uh, black cartoonist who drew Captain Marvel back in the 1940s. Wow. Um, so, uh, you know, it was, it was really a question of why not? I mean, why hasn't there been as opposed to uh, anything else? No. Well, what a powerful and beautiful answer. Thank you. Yes. Seriously, thank you very much. Mr. Wolfman, before we move any further, um, I have something that I wanted to mention to you and I hope you don't mind. Uh, we've actually met before, sir. Oh, I have no memory. You know, was <laughs> uh, it was either in 2016 or 2015 and you were, uh, you were making an appearance at a Baltimore Comic-Con. And with me being a huge fan of the Teen Titans, I was moving around within the convention hall and a young lady that was working with you at your table. Um, as, as I passed by the table, she ended up, and I still to this day, through all the different people that were there, don't know what caused her to single me out. But as I was passing by your table and I was looking for your table in reality because you had a print that I wanted to purchase. And she happened to look across and said, excuse me, are you a Marv Wolfman fan? <laughs> and I ended up moving toward the table because I was thrown at that point. I thought maybe I had done something wrong. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, throughout the course of uh, being at your table for the few minutes that I was, the, um, one of your covers for uh, the opening issue of the new Teen Titans was the one that I was looking for, and those had sold out. Uh -huh. You, in turn, sir, said, well, okay, since that one is gone, what are you looking for? And you presented me with this, and you signed it. <laughs> oh, I don't remember. It, uh, it, that's so strange because it doesn't sound like my daughter would do that. But uh, I'm glad. She, if it was her, I'm glad she did it. If it was somebody else sitting at my uh, a worker at the uh, the convention, sometimes they'd have. If you have to get up and walk around, they'll they'll right. seat place her. So maybe it was a conventioner or something. I don't know. But uh, I'm glad she did, and I'm glad you got her. I, I, I just want to thank you again because I'm a huge Titans fan and having that done and the fact that you signed it and what have you, I was amazed. Oh, well, thank you. So uh, again, I thank you. Uh, and again, this is more, <clears throat> this is more of an example of what we talked about in the beginning, just how powerful, how powerfully you touched lives and even a gesture like that, even you know, frankly, joining us and having this conversation with us, it just continues on. And, and again, we're eternally grateful. You, you said something that's interesting to me, and, I, and, I, and I, I would like for you to maybe paint that picture, because you were talking about how as, as collaborators, um, as colleagues, you know, you guys used to hang out. What was that like being in New York City, a young person? By the way, I'm from Queens, uh, you're from Flushing, uh, Flushing, Queens. <laughs> we weren't too far from one another. But um, 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 what was that? What was the environment like? Did you go to the office to work? Um, 
did you guys hang out afterwards at the club and did you discuss you know what's happening in you know in a certain comic book did you did were you fans of other each other's work you know what what, what was, if you can paint that picture for us of what it's like to be a young comic creator in those days well um you know essentially if you were all the same age and you were all breaking in at the same time and having the same problems because uh, you know a lot of the a lot of the older talent wasn't were not quite as happy to see young talent there um, simply because they realized that which we did not know because we didn't know the politics at the time uh, sure. but they probably sensed that the that things were going to be changing uh, for them uh, and that's sort of uh, really hard if you've been working in a creative field, doing everything you can uh, to to suddenly find that and you have to, I think, treat the people a lot a lot better. Um, but yeah, we were, we became friends, but you know, like any group of people who have similar interests. So and we still were comic book fans. We got every comic book that was published, pretty much. Uh, we get together for parties and stuff of that sort. It, it, I don't think there's anything different from us uh, as comic book guys getting together after work as a bunch of people who go out bowling for the night and uh, they talk about stuff and they go and they have the hamburgers and they, you know, fries and they talk about whatever is the, the big thing in their lives. Uh, I, people aren't different. Uh, it's just, you know, what they do is what they do and has nothing to do with who they are. Did you have a mindset? Uh, did you have a particular approach? And did you recognize at the time that your approach was different from the previous generation's approach and, and, and that you were changing things, that, that you were evolving the industry? Uh, just to some degree, but that took a while uh, because we had to move through everything to be put in to get into that position that we could do a lot of that stuff that we thought that we thought the comic industry should go for. So, you know, when I got into comics at the very, very beginning and prior to me, comics were done for kids six to 10 Correct. years old. And there's only, and, but, you know, we were teenagers and up ourselves. And we saw a different potential for comics because we were comic book fans. You gotta remember that the people who were in comic books before us, for them, it was a job. It, they were not fans of it because there were no comic books. Of course. And, but we were fans of comic, they wanted to be either novelists if they were writers or if they were artists to do a comic strip for the newspapers. We wanted to do comic books and Therefore, we were very, very different from the generation that preceded, uh, only because this was our goal. And therefore, we wanted to make it the best we could. And we wanted to grow the comics so that we, so they were stories we could read. We understood that the readership was changing. A lot of the people in the business didn't, didn't know that. Uh, but we were the fans, we, we knew who was buying them. We knew who was attending comic book conventions when they first sure. began. So, um, it was, you know, it was just a very, as I said, the same as everybody else, just a different business. Um, it, it's fascinating because in many ways that continued to, ha to happen. And I think the generation that came after our generation had the same, situation in other words they were fans coming into the field but i think their approach was different than what our generation's approach was in other words there, there was there seemed to be a certain level of respect for the character for the genre and for what came before whereas new creators tend to bring their vision and, and make that vision fit the character so i want to i want to ask you about that a little bit later but uh, kevin did you have a did you have a question uh <clears throat> pardon me uh, if I may, I'd, I'd like to ask a uh, quick follow-up. Based on the fact that you were one of the uh, early pioneers of, of the business, how did that affect your family? And what did your parents think about the fact that you were getting into the comic industry? 
Oh, I, I don't think that anybody uh, thought that was a good move. They wanted, me, they wanted me to be a teacher. And in fact, I have a degree, in, uh, you know, uh, uh, and I was a teacher, I taught, I taught junior high school art. Um, I just hated it and went back into comics. Uh, wow. Comics were not respected. There was no way that uh, anybody back in the 1950s or 60s would have assumed it was a healthy business. Okay. Um, yeah. Who, who could have imagined? Sure. Especially <laughs> what, what, what's happening, happening to today, quality. you know? That has nothing to do with the quality of it, just the, whether or not people are gonna respect it. The quality was starting to come uh, as stories, as books were being written and meant for, and read by uh, teenagers and up rather than eight to 10 year olds. So once you know you're now writing for a 15 year old, you can change a lot of it. Once you start knowing you're being read by college students, you change the type of writing you do because they're not gonna be interested in a Superman story where Lois tries to figure out who Clark Kent is. You know, uh, They want something else. And, and that's what you brought to the table. I remember uh, Spider-Man 200, for example, working with Keith Pollard, which, who, by the way, I, I think as an artist doesn't get um, the credit that he deserves. I think he's a terrific artist and he should have been a bigger superstar than, than he turned out to be. But, you know, the, the, the approach of Spider-Man dealing with the guy who killed uh, Uncle Ben, you know, these are the comic books that stay with you and that impact you because it just connects. But it's... It's, it's a multi-layered comic. And what I love about your work um, is that while the stories are sophisticated, while the stories are complex and emotional and impactful, it stays within the genre and it respects the genre. It is a superhero and it is Spider-Man. And so what's your thought on that? What, have you noticed the difference in new creators and their approach to comics? And what's, what's your feeling on it? I think uh, what happens is every creator, as they come into the business, uh, bring their background with them. And to me, it's vital that comics keep progressing. If, if the current batch of writers was writing exactly the type of stuff that I did in 1980, people would be giving up the comics because they've read it already. So you have to keep moving, otherwise the field itself is dead. Uh, if you look at... Um, television that has drastically changed since the 1950s. If you look at uh, almost anything that's based on a creative uh, business, it changes with the times. So I believe that you have to change and you have to understand, and you have to be willing, not only willing to change, you have to be looking to see what's, going, what's the next group of people going to like. What, are the people who haven't yet gotten into comics looking for that you can do. Uh, you have to keep expanding. That's fascinating. That's fascinating that you feel that way. Okay. Is that, uh, if, if you don't mind, Mr. Uh, Mr. Wolfman, the changes that you're speaking of, is that what brought about the creation of Blade? Um, and where did you get your inspiration for Blade from? Uh, you know, I was put onto a Dracula uh, and I was trying to figure out uh, what I would do. It was not a book I wanted to do work on. I wanted Doctor Strange and it was, uh, the, there were two books that needed writers at that particular time. One was Doctor Strange and one was uh, Tomb of Dracula. Uh, and Roy Thomas rightfully felt that I would be far better on Tomb of Dracula because I had written all the stories for House of Mystery and House of Secrets and he knew that I could do the horror stuff. And my superhero stuff wasn't quite, I hadn't yet figured that out yet as a writer. I knew it as a fan, but I didn't figure out what I could do to make it, uh, to make it stuff that I was interested in. I just didn't have a viewpoint. So um, uh, as far as Blade, uh, People don't always believe me when I say this, but I have since since I created it. So it's, it's written uh, in lots of interviews at the time. Uh, Blade came to me in literally one second. 
I was walking home from work, uh, coming, uh, walking there, and um, suddenly er the entire concept of blade came to me. I wasn't looking for uh, to come up with anything. I wasn't trying. I was just going home. But wow. The thing came to me, and literally one second, I knew what he looked like. I knew what he wore. I knew his clothing. I knew uh, the concepts behind the character. Wow. And it's only happened to me twice. Uh where they came to me. Otherwise, most of the other characters I've created, I work really hard developing. But Blade and later uh, Deathstroke uh, were the two characters that came to me literally in one second. Wow, wow. So it, it must have been interesting and fascinating to see that creation come to life as one of the perhaps first, it, you know, people don't, don't uh, they do realize it, but Blade was the first of the Marvel superheroes to, you know, bring forth this genre of superhero uh, uh, movies. Uh, I think I think uh, Black Panther was. I think Black Panther long preceded because Stan and Jack wrote it and drew it. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I mean, from the from the movies point of view, the Blade oh, was the I first the first movie, the the first Marvel movie that you know that that you know that um, made Marvel superhero movies possible in in, in in essence. But no, you're absolutely right. Black Panther was a very very key character. Uh, question that I have is, you mentioned Roy Thomas. How was it working with Roy Thomas? We're fans of his as yes. well. Uh, how, how was it um, becoming an editor? Uh, and, the, and the last question is, um, what was your favorite superhero? You talked about you didn't want to work with Tuma Dracula, you wanted to start work with Doctor Strange. So which was, I, I know you have an affinity for Fantastic Four, and of course, we'll talk about the Teen Titans later, but what was your favorite superhero at that time? And what you know book did you really want to work on? Uh, at DC, my favorite character, and I've said it a million times, is Superman, uh, because he's a positive character. Batman yes. is a negative. Um, I, like, I like Batman. I'm not putting it down. I'm just less interested in writing Batman than I am Superman. And I've had long runs on both books. Uh, and at Marvel, my favorite character was Spider-Man. Excellent. Uh-huh. Okay. Yes. Uh, Fantastic Four was my next favorite um, uh, because the book, but there's not a character in the Fantastic Four that I would say that about, but the whole book was one of my favorites. Uh, your work on Spider-Man, I mean, your, your love for Spider-Man just comes through. Um, Spider-Man is my favorite character as well. And again, your run on Spider-Man Okay. Yes, absolutely. And and obviously the truth is you're running everything that you've touched. You've yes. been that <laughs> you've been that good. Let's talk about this. And Kevin, forgive me if I jump in. It's okay. But, but you know, I and correct us if, if we're wrong, but it culminates to uh working with George Perez and the Teen Titans. That, does it not? Or, or or do you do you have a different point of view of it? I don't know what the question is. So, so in other words, your career, when you look at it, um, you know, it's almost as if you were building up to, to this, you know, big achievement of, you know, the George Perez, the team, the new Teen Titans, it becomes a, a hugely successful, uh, um, uh, you know, a project that brings about, uh, that brings about a change in DC that in my view, saved DC and brought a new DC and brought DC to the table. What, what, so is, is that how you look at it as well? And, and, and what was your, what, what, what's your feeling on the Teen Titans? Well, obviously I love the book and the characters. Um, the, it's, it, it's, it's hard to really uh, give an answer to that. Uh, hmm. When I came to DC, I was at Marvel for years and I loved the Marvel books. Uh, I left for other reasons. Um, and uh, I really wish I could have kept uh, writing Spider-Man. I would have loved to. Uh, but, um, you know, you can only work at, at that point at one company at a time. It's not like today. Uh, if you worked at DC, you couldn't work for Marvel and vice versa. Uh, so, um, I wanted to bring to DC the things that I liked about Marvel. Yes. And, and at DC, uh, 
I learned everything at DC because I started there. And then Marvel moved me in other directions. So for DC, it's DC's sense of plotting that I liked, how, how they, their stuff was very much story driven. Uh, Marvel was very much character and action driven. So for me, what I want to do is I didn't want to do DC and I didn't want to do Marvel. I wanted to do the best of both. And Fascinating. it's, so my stuff, my attempt, and hopefully I succeeded, is that it has the story and the twist and the turns and the different concepts that DC was able to come up with. And at the same time, it has the character and action and, and power that the Marvel books have. Correct. Now, Stan has many things, and he's a brilliant, brilliant writer and all that, but his, he wasn't strong on plotting. He was great on dialogue and great on character and great yes. on... Yes. I mean, could come up with... <laughs> I don't even know how he came up with half that stuff. Uh, and the same with uh, DC. It was all plot. The plot concepts, they keep changing, keep doing different things. Um, they weren't always written for the audience that I wanted the comics, but I appreciated real stories. Each issue was a complete story. They weren't as strong as the Marvel stories, but they were straight stories. And I wanted to do that and then add on top of that, the excitement and the um, action and characterization of a Marvel book. So a little bit of both. That makes perfect sense. That makes perfect sense. And that's why that book was so special because, you know, you know, there are so many plot lines and so many storylines within the Teen <laughs> Titans, whether it's um, Trigon, Trigon uh, with Raven or, or, or Starfire fighting her sister Commander, or, or, you know, there's so many really good, exciting story and character driven you know um, um, stories within the, the Teen Titans that I was, was an absolutely huge fan now as it became the juggernaut that it became were you aware of that working with George Perez did you realize that you were now superstars and here's a question that I have was there a sense of a bit of a competition because you know you, you've got the Teen Titans <laughs> And uh, Chris Claremont's got, you know, and John Byrne are doing the X-Men. Was there any sort of sense of, I want to outdo you type of thing or, or no? <laughs> I, I don't, I, I don't know. You'd have to ask Chris on his thing, but I didn't, I was not a big X-Men fan. That's why I never, I really didn't read the book that much. Wow. Um, <laughs> now, is that a jab or is that? Is... <laughs> uh, uh, the few times I've been on a panel with Chris, he generally has stated that the only similarity between Titans and X-Men was we took old characters, introduced some new ones and made them more exciting than the original book. Uh, yeah. And I, I agree with Chris on that. Uh, we weren't in competition uh, uh, because again, we were all fans. I, I'm, I was the editor at, DC, at Marvel who hired Chris. That's right. So oh. you know, uh, we all were friends. We're, so it's a very different thing. I think people always assumed the Marvel guys and the DC guys would get together and beat each other up. But no, we <laughs> we get together and play cards. You know. <laughs> Do you yeah. have a favorite Titan, sir? I never talk about that. Uh, my view is you don't. Do you have a favorite kid? <laughs> 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 if you do, you don't tell. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's an excellent <laughs> answer. <laughs> um, so now you're doing the Teen Times with George Perez. It's a fantastic book. The stories are powerful. They're driven. They they go. I mean, there's just great, great, great stuff. Um, talk about Crisis on Infinite Earths. How that came about. Who who's generated the idea, um, and and how did it come about to to do this? Uh, crisis on Infinite Earth. Was the goal to change DC and make it something else, or was it just to write a story? No, the goal was DC sales weren't very good, except for Titans. Titans was uh, selling like a Marvel comic, huge yep. amount. Regular DC books weren't. They were doing fairly poorly at the time. Um, and I felt that DC had a lot of really good characters and they just needed to be seen by, uh, if, you, if you go back in time a little bit, you may remember that people called themselves Marvel zombies at the time. Um, 
because they blindly like Marvel yes. uh, over DC. They wouldn't even read a DC book. As a fan who grew up reading DCs and Marvels and Archie comics and everything, I just liked comic books. Uh, the, the, what a comic book was, I didn't have a favorite company. You could tell by, again, how I talked about writing. I like the plotting of DC. I like the action of Marvel. You, I took the best of all of those things. So I, I came up with the idea. Um, and uh, the whole thing is in the letter column of the very first issue. It's on the inside front cover of the first issue and it's been printed a hundred times. It's, it's how I, it talks about how I came up with the concept for crisis, how I sold it and then wrote it. Um, the idea was to make Marvel fans look at the DC books and realize there's a lot of good characters and a lot of good books that, they, uh, that they've been ignoring. And that was my whole goal. And uh, DC, nothing like it had ever been done before. So I was thrilled that they accepted it because uh, it was fairly risky. Nobody knew if it would do well. Nobody had an idea about anything because nobody had done a book like this. Absolutely. Uh, so um, I was the only one who was 100% confident that it would be a huge, huge success. What I wasn't sure was how much it would lead to change of readership. Um, would people actually start looking at a DC comic? And it turned out they did. And the they did. I, I was one of those people, I have to admit. I was one of those people that was an exclusively Marvel person, never looked at a DC comic book. And then I ran into the Teen Titans, became a huge fan of the Teen Titans. And once Crisis finished, of course, Crisis introduced me to a lot of DC characters. And, and that introduction made me fall in love with the characters and follow them post-crisis. The, uh, the thing that most people didn't notice, uh, because I keep talking about the fact that I did it to get people to look at all these DC characters, is if you look at Crisis, you'll notice that the big heroes, the ones everyone thinks of when they think of DC, Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman, Flash, Green Lantern, they don't appear for, for the most part. That's right. Six That's issues right. or so. Because I didn't want readers to think, oh, DC is, the, they think that Superman, uh, DC is just Superman. And they don't like Superman for some reason. And right. I wasn't going to put Superman in it until a number of issues have passed so that they should see that DC has all these other characters. So the goal was always to introduce them to the pantheon of DC as opposed to uh, keep, as opposed to them thinking that DC was only about Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman. It was about wow. that, and that, and that was planned right in the story. It's, I mean, I mean, you look at that book and you see only, um, I mean, you don't see the big characters show up for a while. Absolutely, absolutely. You, I mean, you totally took a gamble and it paid precisely it was exactly what you envisioned and so and that's exactly hardest, how it worked it was the hardest book in the world to write uh and edit and and, and do because i had very specific goals in mind and uh, they each goal had to be uh, re, uh hit correctly uh it had to be done because the, the thing could have gone south very easily and it, I, I had to work real hard to make sure it didn't Fortunately, I think you had a great partner um, on that project, which is George Perez. Yeah. Would you like to take a moment to talk about George Perez? I know you guys are close. I've read many interviews where you obviously um, are very close friends and, and, and love one another. Is there anything you'd like to say about George Perez? Yeah, well, most, the, the thing for me is that everyone knows how good an artist George is. I mean, you look at his art, you know, he's brilliant. What most people only if you meet him at a convention and get to learn is he's one of the best people you could ever meet. He's wow. one of the nicest and most caring people you could ever meet. So the luck was not that I got a great artist on the book. The luck was I got a great partner on the book. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. You did something that was unique. And I remember even then noticing it and appreciating it. That is to say, you gave co-writing credit 
to, to George Perez on, on the Teen Titans. And mm -hmm. it, it gave me as a fan the sense of, wow, this is a true collaboration. And in oh. my imagination, I imagine how you guys work together. Uh, what made you do that? Uh, besides the obvious that you were, but what made you, you know, give that official credit? Uh, the credits work out were in my mind as to what do they actually do, what everybody does. Uh, if I follow the old DC thing of writing a full script and then it goes to an artist, my name would be listed as the writer. Uh, and uh, my name would be listed first because the script. George and I didn't work that way. George and I, I'd come in with a basic idea for the story that I, was, uh, that I wanted to do. And then the two of us would sit down and break it down. So he was co-writing the book with me. Therefore, he gets the co-writing uh, uh, credit. And he got plotting money as well, co-money co co on that too. If you do, you should be, uh, if you're doing that job, you should be credited with that job. Uh, and uh, George, George was absolutely the best co-writer, co-plotter, co-everything that I could possibly even imagine uh, because he, he understood the characters inside and out. And not to give him, that the, his due would have been completely ridiculous. Uh, he did the job. Why should I? Don't need you know. I had already made a success on Tomb Dracula. I had made a success on a bunch of other things. I didn't need to satisfy my ego. I only cared about the book, Fantastic. and George only cared about the book. Uh, and yes, we were friends on top of that. But when we got together the very first time on the very first issue it was very clear that we were going to work together on this book. And it's not just me as the writer or a later editor or whatever else, it was the two of us who were producing the book together. And that's how it had to be. That's beautiful. That's absolutely beautiful. It, it lives up to all the expectations that we have as, a fan, as fans. Kevin, any questions? Having, uh, having worked with Mr. Perez and, and so many other talented people uh do you still have a dream collaboration in mind in the back of your mind um, is there another writer or another artist you would still love to work with and have yeah, the the i think you look at the talent that's in the business today and i think Overall, I mean, in the past, in, in the past, you had something like an, uh, George. He was an anomaly. He was so good compared to everyone else. Today, you have far more really good people in the business, um, and I would love to work with tons of them. Uh, uh, but you know, that's really not my decision. <laughs> So uh, that, that's fascinating. Uh, I and you're absolutely right, by the way, the, the, the pool of talented artists is much greater than, than it was back in the day. Have you caught the irony of you coming into DC, um, taking and clearing up the multiversal mess that basically made DC the second class citizen of, 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 of comic books uh, <laughs> at the time? And you, you clear that up and created a, a single, you know, universe. Um, and have you realized that ever since you've done that, Marvel has gone the opposite and going from a single universe to creating a multiverse. Whereas now there are so many versions of the characters that in essence, from a comic book point of view, what was happening to DC is now happening to Marvel where you don't really know Spider-Man, you don't really know, you know, the Hulk and, and, and these characters have, have sort of disappeared a little bit. I, uh, I don't buy any comics really these days. Uh, I will get a special graphic uh, album if my local store uh, says something that, uh, that I should read a certain book or something. Uh, but I don't buy monthlies at all. Uh, I read the collection, collected editions on occasion, uh, if, if it's been recommended. Um, you know, there are a thousand comics com coming out every day. Uh, these, you, you shouldn't be surprised that they bring back old concepts. I always assumed 
uh, that somebody would bring back a multiverse at DC. But the difference was we got rid of the multiverse in order to make it simple for people to follow. Correct. And because the Marvel readers weren't reading DC books, so you had to make it simple. You had to make it something that they would understand. And that worked. Today, it's a little bit different. People follow, uh, people are more aware because they're older. They're not the eight to 10 year olds anymore. So they can understand these concepts and the new talent wanted to create those. I always expected it. I was, ho I was hoping it would take longer for it to come back. But, you know, for the most part, um, even Flash took 26 years, I think, to come back. And Supergirl the same. It took years and years. So it wasn't an instant turnover. We didn't finish Crisis and then suddenly Supergirl was created again. Uh, but you, you have to assume those things are going to come back. And I, I know that Marvel's doing a lot of the multiverse um, uh, stuff at this particular point. And in fact, I think they have a TV show coming out that's even named after that. Uh, so, yeah, I, I know it. It's just, you know, that's what they did. I do my stuff. They do their stuff. I I'm curious about something. And forgive me, Kevin, for jumping in. I'm curious about something. Uh, you started off as a fan and and became a creator we you know continued to be a fan even as you were creating you continue to work and to produce work um and i imagine did your fandom die down or are you not reading the current books because you don't find them interesting and I, and it's fascinating because Every time we talk to a, to a creator of our generation, there seems to be like, you, you know, you, you don't want to criticize the, the, the current creators and the current books, but what, what reason would you give as to why you, you're not interested in the monthlies anymore? Uh, because that's what's happening to us. We're comic book fans and we love these characters. And uh, in many ways, some of the decisions in the industry has pushed us away from from the characters in the industry that we love in, and in my case <laughs> in my case it's a matter of memory i can't remember the stories from month to month the stories go on too long and there are so many of them i just can't keep track of everything so that's why i said i only read the collected editions right. if i could read an entire story fine uh but i'm not in i can't read you know a, a 10 part story from month to month and remember it all it's just that's the way it is the other thing is I've written, I've read a billion comics and I've written a billion comics. Uh, my free time, I wanna read other stuff as well. And so I just generally, unless it's recommended to me as something special, um, I generally don't uh, read more of what I've already read uh, to some degree. The talent that I, I look at some of the writers today and they are incredible. So it has nothing to do with the quality of the books. I look at uh, say Tom King or Scott Snyder or so many of those people from that generation of uh, writers and they're writing some brilliant, brilliant comics. Uh, they're using the medium in ways we never could have because we were writing for a different audience. And comics, you had to go through an awful lot to get to where uh, Tom could do, Tom King could do the um, vision vision uh, uh, series that he did. He had to go through a lot of other growth before he could get to that. Understood. After just a few more minutes, maybe 10 minutes. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, Kevin, if, do you have a last? Uh, yeah, um, uh, two quick questions. If given the opportunity to do a new DC Marvel crossover what two characters or group of characters would you use well you know, um they've already done so much with superman and obviously i would love to do superman and spider-man uh just to write them again um uh i've had the fortune of being able to do what i feel is my best superman story not that long ago it was published uh, last year um so but otherwise, I would love to do the one, one that I was supposed to do before, uh, and that would have been Titans and X-Men. Uh, but in truth, I would probably rather do Sp Superman and Spider-Man. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> not having read a lot of the X-Men, 
uh, I'd have to do too much research, and I just don't have any interest in research. Mr. Wolfman, you, you, I, I have to tell you, you, you just touched my heart because one of the major things that I wish Hollywood would do is uh, a live action adaptation, or even if it was done animated, uh, of Superman versus Spider-Man. And the fact that you just mentioned the two of them, it makes my heart melt. So <laughs> you, you, you'd be, you should be the writer on that, on that project. Uh, well, uh, one last question, if I may. Um, so you're working on different things. You're doing videos and you're doing, uh, you know, different types of work. What's that like? Are you enjoying that? It, does it give you the same sense of satisfaction as writing a comic book? And what's the future look like for for you? Uh, I enjoy doing them because they're, uh, as I say, since I don't read, a, I'm not up to date and I don't read an awful lot of the books today. I don't know the common continuity. Uh, you know, I hear about it and I, I probably know some of it, but, uh, um, writing something for a video game or writing uh, using the same exact characters uh, or a novel or some of the other stuff I get to still play with those characters but I don't have to worry about the continuity and what 75 other books are doing with those characters at the same time I mean, uh, if it was my own stuff my own creations that would be different I would love to do my own um, but that's about it, yeah. Well, thank you so very much for joining us today and sharing your thoughts and your story with us. Again, we are huge fans and you have made our maybe lifetime by sitting there and talking to us and, and, and being so open and so kind and so generous. You talked about George Perez being a great man. I think uh, you're equally a great partner to him. So again, thank you. Thank you. You take this care. It's been an honor and a pleasure, sir. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, oh, what'd you think? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> that went well. That man. was unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> that went well. That wow. Went well. <laughs> So uh, I am excellent. not going to be able to sleep for days. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so that was awesome. We just got a chance to interview Marv Wolfman. Holy um, cow. This looks like a job for Superman. Hey, look, it's Spider-Man. The dynamic, the dynamic duo, duo returns. Return. Next, Next week, don't, don't miss it. Miss it.